Good afternoon. It's Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. Um, not a bad day out. A little windy and too dry. Although there is a promise of rain over the next few days, so I hope that we get that promise and we get a goodly shower. Uh, we certainly could need it. Um, there are parts of the state where it is much worse than here, but everywhere is dry. So keep praying for a timely and a useful rain. A couple of announcements I want to touch on today. First of all, you may or may not have heard of phishing schemes. A phishing scheme is often an email or a text message um, pretending to be from somebody whom you know, seeking some kind of financial aid. Oftentimes it involves getting um, store cards or gift cards and and then sending that information to the person who had sent you the email or the text message. Oftentimes of late, people who operate these phishing scams are impersonating pastors. And so please understand and let other people know that I will never, under any circumstance whatsoever, send you an email or a text message asking for funds of any kind. If one comes in my name, under my email, or under a text message under my name, it is a scam. I would not do that. So please, please, please let people know, because there are people who are being tricked into spending money, thinking they're helping their church or their pastor, when actually they're, they're being scammed by some very unscrupulous people. So do keep that in mind. Reminder of worship services this coming Sunday. 8.30 at St. Paul, 10.30 at First, both services with Holy Communion. Both services will be live streamed. I am going to attempt doing the FM radio broadcast. I did a trial run this morning from both congregations, and the reach wasn't too bad. Probably within a, a four-block circle around St. Paul, and, and essentially the same thing out at First. There are some logistical things I have to get sorted out first before I'm confident that it's going to work at both congregations. Um, but it's a good start, and, and I'm optimistic. And, of course, one of the good things out of this is that the unit I purchased is a very portable unit, and all I will have to do is move it from one church to the next and hook it up at both sound systems, and that should be a rather straightforward thing. If you want to listen in this Sunday... Uh, the, f the frequency on the FM band will be 95.5 at St. Paul's, and out at first it will be 87.9. 95.5 at St. Paul's and 87.9 at first. I have to do that separately because there's a station that has the 95.5 I can get reception out at first on, and so I have to move it to a, to a blank area on the dial. But... Like I said, if I get a chance to get, I need to get a couple pieces of cabling to uh, to make the connections proper, and um, and then run another test, and hopefully then I'll be able to do a trial run this coming Sunday. Uh, I will let you know hopefully Friday or Saturday uh, if we're going to go ahead with that. Just and since it is Communion Sunday this Sunday, I'm also going to be um, working with the Guttenberg Care Center to provide sacrament for the members of St. Paul's that are resident there. Uh, we right now currently have four members of St. Paul who are resident at the care center, and unfortunately I have not been able to get to them since February. Uh, and it doesn't look I'm going to get inside the building anytime soon. So as I showed you yesterday, I've gotten a new home communion kit, which we will have as part of the worship service at St. Paul's, and then uh, we will take to, to Guttenberg Care Center and then the activity director there will provide the sacrament for our members. And I'm grateful that we could work that out. Uh, I can meet face-to-face -face for a very limited time with our members at the Great River Care Center. I was going to do that yesterday, but the, the spike in the virus in our county and our being a red zone, I decided it was better to wait until things weren't quite as active. I'm hoping to get to them next Wednesday. And I think we have residents at Scenic Acres and El Cater. Uh, I haven't talked with those facilities yet, uh, and I will need to to kind of work things out. I am trying to visit the home communions if people want me to. Uh, if you want me to come to your home and bring you the sacrament, please let me know. 
that would be the best way for me to to get you on the list of people to commune. Hopefully, again, hopefully the virus will dial itself back a bit and we can relax some of our guidances and precautions. But until then, we want to be safe and keep the good, good cautions in place. On the subject of Holy Communion, I want to share again with you um, the first recording of the institution of the Lord's Supper in the New Testament, and that comes from chapter 11 of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And it begins at the 23rd verse. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. This is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in truth. Your word is truth. Amen. We Lutherans are word and sacrament Christians. That is to say, we place a high value on the word of God. And the word of God isn't just the scripture or the proclaimed word. The word of God also comes to us in the form of the holy sacraments. The sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, are the word of God in physical, tangible forms. One cannot be a Christian without being baptized. We join the church through the gift of holy baptism. Christianity is not a hereditary thing. It is not something you inherit from your parents. Christianity is something that we are given as a gift from God when we are baptized into the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And then the Lord's Supper is that gift that nurtures the faith that was given to us in our baptisms. In the Lutheran Church, we determine that our, there are two acts within the scriptures that meet the level of a sacrament. And we use the guidance that Luther gave us on what is a sacrament. And Luther had three points. That, and the first point is there has to be a command of Christ. Somewhere in the scriptures, Jesus needed to say clearly, do this. We see that in baptism. We see this in the Lord's Supper. The words that are used there are words of command. Do this as often as you would. Baptize them all. Words of command. And so Jesus commands us to do this. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are not optional for Christians. They are at the heart of what it is to be a believer. The second element or part of determining a sacrament is there always has to be a promise of forgiveness attached to the sacrament. And of course, in holy baptism, we have the washing away of our sins through the dying and the rising of Jesus and our being buried with him. And in the Lord's Supper, as we eat and drink, Jesus promises us that we receive the forgiveness of sins. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, as St. Paul says. And then finally, Luther determined that for something to be a sacrament, it had to have an earthly element. An earthly element that was tangible, that we could see, that we could taste, that we could touch. And of course, the earthly element for holy baptism is water. And the earthly elements for the Lord's Supper are bread and wine. We baptize using water because that's what was done by the disciples at the command of Jesus. And we use bread and wine, the bread and wine of the Passover that Jesus announced was now his body and blood. And so whenever we gather as Christians and whenever we hear the words of the institution, that Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and blessed wine and distributed it to his disciples, we are confident that we are receiving the very real body and blood of Jesus. Of course, not all churches agree with that thinking. The vast majority of Protestant churches talk about the Lord's Supper as a memorial meal, where we receive bread and wine, and in some cases grape juice, in remembrance or in memory of Jesus. It's simply bread and wine. In the Roman Catholic Church, there is the understanding that the bread and the wine, once consecrated, are forever after the body and blood of Jesus. That's called transubstantiation. The elements of bread and wine are transubstantiated. Their substance is changed 
into the body and blood of Christ and therefore cannot be returned to bread and wine. If you go into a Catholic church, you will notice on the altar what looks like a small temple or a box. And in that box is the reserved host, the host that was previously consecrated and now is reserved on the altar. And you know that there is, there is reserved host on the altar in a Catholic church because the red candle is burning at the front of the church. That's what that candle means. We Lutherans have turned it into an eternal candle or an eternal flame, but in the Catholic Church it is a signal to the faithful that the consecrated host is on the altar. And that's why you see Catholics genuflecting or kneeling before they go into their pew. They are reverencing the presence of Christ in the sacrament. We Lutherans kind of land in the middle. We believe that the bread and the wine are indeed the very body and blood of Jesus. And we believe that for the simple reason that Jesus said, it is my body, it is my blood. He was very clear about that in four different places in Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Corinthians. Jesus said to his disciples and to us, this is my body, this is my blood, as he commanded us to eat of the meal. And so we believe that once the words of institutions are proclaimed and we have heard those words and trust them in faith, that Christ is present in the bread and the wine of Holy Communion. How he is present is a mystery to us. But he is present because he has promised to be there. And as faithful Christians and as Lutherans, we accept that word for what it is, the command of Christ, that he is present in the bread and the wine. Now, there is some discussion in the Lutheran Church about what about after the Lord's Supper is celebrated in the congregation. We have a variety of thinking on that, but I think the most helpful is that the bread and the wine that were on the altar were consecrated and were used in the Lord's Supper at that particular worship service can be reserved, as they are for our members who are in the care centers, as the bread and the wine and the body and blood of Jesus. We do not distinguish when the bread goes back to being bread and when the wine goes back to being wine. Rather, we treat what has been on the altar as if it were the very body and blood of Jesus. And so the correct practice for us as Lutherans is if it's been consecrated on the altar, it goes in that little metal cup that we have at the, at the altar called a ciborium. Those are the bread, the hosts that have been consecrated at previous, Luther, um, at previous Lord's Supper. And the wine if it isn't consumed, is to be poured out onto the ground and not returned to the bottle. I know it seems kind of complicated and sometimes you scratch your head and say, why is it important? We believe observing the Lord's Supper the way we do is important because of the command of Christ. If Jesus had told us to do something other at the Lord's Supper, then that is what we would do because it is his command. But we do what we do because we trust that the command of Jesus is true and faithful, and we can rely upon it. That even though we do not comprehend how bread and wine can be body and blood at the same time, we trust it because Jesus has said so. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. And we simply believe. That's why before each communion service, I announced to the congregation that Holy Communion is for the baptized who have heard the promise of Christ and trust that promise those who have been baptized and have heard and trust the promise may come and receive what the Lord offers. And a couple of final notes. We are not, not of one mind in the Lutheran Church about when communion should begin in a person's life. Most Lutheran churches that I know right now have settled on the age of 11 or 12 or 5th grade uh, as First Communion. And that's an okay practice. If a parent were to come to me, or say if we were to baptize an infant, and the parents would ask me to commune that infant on the day of their baptism, I would do so, because that is a practice that goes back to the very earliest days of the church. And a baptized infant is a believing Christian, and all that is necessary to receive the Lord's Supper is confidence or faith that the Lord is doing what he promised to do. And a newly baptized infant has that faith. It is rare that that ever happens, but I have communed children as young as two or three. 
because they want the Lord's Supper and their parents allow it and believe that it is a blessing to them as well. So that's something if you have a question about, we can certainly talk about. But I think that's enough about the Lord's Supper for today. Let's pray a bit. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Sacraments by which we come into the church and are part of the dying and rising of Jesus and the supper that nourishes us and keeps us faithful and steadfast. Help us to treasure these sacraments and to make of them something blessed in our lives every day. We thank you for being present with us today. We ask for timely rains for the weeks to come. And if it be your will and purpose, give us tomorrow. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Well, I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. And until then, goodbye now.